a little time for questions. And I should, having, having got my own questions in sneakily during the, uh, during the presentation, I should look for hands. Yes? sort of dismissed Occupy as uh, a bunch of people who hadn't got an agenda or didn't know what they want. And then in the following slide, you celebrated David Graeber, who I think is one mm. of the people who's very active within Occupy, yeah. articulating still further and even more eloquently his views. And I would have thought they kind of summed up what Occupy represent. So how do you feel able to dismiss Occupy so swiftly? Uh, I, I'm not dismissing Occupy. I think it's one of the, the best political movements that have come out recently because it's actually approaching uh, not an ideological problem but a systematic problem. But uh, a lot of the, the flaws... I, I, it seems to me that a lot of the flaws around it seem to be they haven't actually published any definite direction or proposed an alternative to what they're unhappy with. Um, so I don't, I don't dismiss them, but I, I'm excited that they have this potential to really change the world but I, um, I think I'm just a bit worried that they might, it might just pilfer out once people are distracted enough or they've forgotten and they've lost it. It's like, like they need to seize more agency. Is there a sense in which the session is going to be the, the new protest? Well, I talked in, in, um, in my little blurb that I, I believe fundamentally that design can be an antagonist platform. It can be a platform where you can safely... Uh, without hurting people physically, have a conflict between ideologies and have it very violently in the form of design. And to me, that's the, 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 the real potential of design, no matter whether it's focusing on synthetic biology or technology or whatever. It's a place where we can really focalize and focalize, focus and physicalize a conflict. And so potentially design could be a protest movement, I suppose. Mm. Maya, in, in your own work, does, um, um, does this sort of uh, antagonistic potential for design ever raise its head? Or is it something that you deliberately set aside or, 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 or sidestep? Um, well, I think we kind of absorb it <laughs> in, in the work and then look for alternatives. Indeed, where, the, where you could say that the Occupy stops, we are more interested in that space afterwards. So there are a lot of people who who are really good at critiquing things, and we are maybe not so um, adequate or um, able to speak so well. So we just take the problem and, and create an alternative to it. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes. And then, anyone else? Yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry to ask a second question. Um, the, just the image at the end of Tobias's talk of the civil rights march on Washington made me think about a very powerful reality hack that we've seen throughout the 20th century, which is the language hack, um, repurposing the way in which particularly denigratory terms are used, or as Chelsea Manning shows, renaming oneself. Um, and it seems all of us are talking in language. We have Jeff Noon here today, the master of the language hack. And I just wondered if you as the artists and writers collective put together by Simon could talk a bit about language as an infrastructure, language as the territory of dreaming, um, as an element in design. You talked about naming um, bacteria as being an important part of a project. And I think that was a bit of a joke, but I think it's also very true that how we name things conveys their purpose and conveys their relationship to users. So. It's a little bit of a challenge, uh, but picking up on something that I think was in all of your presentations. Um, uh, uh, Paul, I'm yeah, yes. used to ask, answering questions from Sophie because she asked me an awful lot while supervising my master's dissertation. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to have to be careful here and kind of caveat this by saying this is a metaphorical comparison, not a literal one, because otherwise I'm going to tread into the territory of Sapir Wharf and people are going to tell me it's all wrong. Um, but there is a sense in which um, language is, uh, yes, it is an infrastructure. If, if you consider infrastructure to be something that underpins a bunch of more complex systems which are utterly dependent on it. Um, it may not be physical in the sense of the ones that I work with at the moment, but if you think you know, ideologically, politically, economically to some extent, um, language is completely the infrastructure of how we, of how we communicate. Almost every 
uh, all the communications, physical infrastructure we have is, is carrying some form of language. So um, in, in a sense, that almost is you know, an argument to the effect that language is the first and most important technology we came up with anyway. So you could almost view language as a substrate uh, beneath all the other infrastructures to a certain extent. And um, without sounding awfully wanky about it, you know, writers know exactly how powerful language is. Um, you pulled out some brilliant examples, but there's another one that's, that's very contemporary. Um, the, the incredible semantic drift around the word troll in the last three months has, has been kind of fascinating. Um, and there's, there's lots of these. I mean, the, the, the thing is, these, these happen all the time. Um, one, one that I always find quite amusing is the way nowadays we talk about uh, two terms we use to denigrate uh, a very sort of basic entry-level product, standard and vanilla. Vanilla was once, you know, it, well, and, and still ostensibly is, an incredibly uh, expensive and hard-to-obtain seed pod from... Uh, Sri Lanka's mountain, yes, it's, I'm terrible with geography. Um, and, and standard, which we now uh, tend to think of as, as, you know, sort of absolute bottom level, your standard product, not even that long ago, probably post-war, your standard product was your, you know, it was your, your flagship product. It was, it was your flag you put out and say, this is, this is, this represents what we do optimally. And now it's it shifted to, no, well, that's, you know, that's, that's basically what we do, but we can add a whole bunch of stuff on there. And this is, um, commerce is, commerce and politics and all these things colonize the infrastructure of language. Um, and as such, they, because it's not a physical thing, they can kind of mutate it. It's almost a living system as well. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but there's definitely a big thing to be looked at there. And if anyone would like to fund me to do that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> I, I did come across one. Happily, it wasn't it wasn't my problem. It was someone else's problem. Uh, at New Scientist, uh, there was an essay competition uh, saying if you could um, offer a, um, a um, if you were offered a genetically engineered cure for a particular disease that had a particular side effect, would you do it? And it was just orchestrated to get some really interesting essays out. But the best response that we got from that was one line saying, oh, I disagree with the idea because it is not natural. And it's like, <laughs> you could unpack an entire issue with the use yeah. of the word natural there. So I, I wonder, Daisy, is there a sense in which uh, discussions of nature have mm. been shifted by synthetic biology or contain it or restrain the way people think about it or fund it, indeed, or think about what it can do? I think... Considering synthetic biology in terms of both um, revolution and evolutionary technology is important. Um, that it is in terms of the people who fund it, or no, in terms of industry and, and regulation, it is an evolution of what's gone before. And in terms of people who want to fund it or get funding, it is more revolutionary because it's something new and it's worth funding. And both of those sit on an uncomfortable spectrum with when we think about nature as opposed to synthetic biology, because, um, as I, I was saying earlier in conversation with someone, that it is a technological field, but it is ultimately a political field. Um, that is a technology that needs to be funded, and you need to have people who want it, and there is a feeling within the synthetic biology community that the public doesn't want this, or if they understood it more, then they'd want it. And that assumption from the pub is that the public thinks it's not natural, or it's a bit you know, a bit scary or something that they just don't understand it and that that's the thing that needs to, we need to get over. And you know, we start to think about nature as separate from, you know, we know that everything that is culture is not separate from nature and nature is an artificial construct in itself. But it's amazing how so much of what I do seems to be trying to, I don't know, this idea of the two cultures, I think that science likes to hide behind the two cultures and I think that all of these divides are sort of put up um, well, it's, it's not natural, the public think it's not natural. All of this stuff it just perpetuates that fundamental, um, original sort of thing of the two cultures that means that um, if only they understood, they want it, so we just will get on with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is something that is a really important divide to cross that's bigger than the nature-culture one. It's the science versus society is somehow being two separate things when society funds science. And science is scientists are society, so I don't know. I think it's the, the divisions that you asked me before. It permeates everything, and none of them are real. <laughs> uh, 
Yes, and um, do we have a second question? Because we'll try and answer to it once if we do. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Get to you eventually. <laughs> Hello, thanks very much. Uh, Matthew Turk from Ninao. Um, I'm trying to kind of like tie some of the things that you that have now kind of been talked about together in some way. And, um, and I guess there's something about the sort of um, the sort of dominant kind of capitalist sort of model, which is a, of, of kind of infrastructure or infrastructural challenges, which is about basically removing kind of detritus or the kind of complications from our lives, you know, as human beings. We, you know, we're kind of the waste example, kind of, you know, water and kind of uh, increasing the ease of, thing, ease, of, ease of things. And in some ways, like, I don't know, if, I don't know whether this, uh, whether you might agree with this, but um, so similarly to this, this idea of kind of seamfulness, maybe kind of like a sort of shitfulness, um, uh, kind of, Alexandra, I'm sort of thinking of your work here, where you're kind of reintroducing this, this actual shit kind of into, into, the, into the discussion. And um, I think that's something that's kind of, you know, kind of exposing this kind of quite natural and very human um, uh, element within, within these kind of infrastructural challenges. Um, maybe it was a point, or it might be something to respond to. I think that's exactly, I mean, so the cheese project, which is Christina and Sissel's, I'm just a willing donor, um, curator <laughs> of it. Um, we're actually making that real in, I'm curating this with Tony Dunn and Paul Fremont, who's a professor of synthetic biology at Imperial. We're curating the show at the Science Gallery in Dublin about synthetic biology, and we're making the cheese for the first time in exhibition. And everyone's, you know, the instant reaction is, it's gross, it's the same with the poo, it's, it's gross, would I want that? But um, it's amazing how just making this stuff tangible and whether this is about fictions, and I think other projects in synthetic aesthetics work differently, but ultimately all of them make artefacts that people can talk about. So whether Oren Katz's project was not about fiction, it was about making algae that digest circuit boards, working with Hideo Iwasaki, um, that's not a fiction, it's a reality, but all of this stuff reminds us that these technologies are not far away. Um, they could be very close and real to us, but the infrastructure that is being built and that synth synthetic biology is establishing now is a technology of vats with goop inside them, locked away, fed by biomass plantations far away on what are called marginal lands or unused lands in Brazil or Indonesia, which actually people live there, and we also call them like rainforests or things like that. And um, the idea that that is what we're going to use to power aeroplanes is a very crazy infrastructure that we're actually setting up now. So in a way, it ties in. It is an infrastructure reality that's actually being set up that we need to challenge. Yeah. And if I can come in on that, I mean, we don't actually need to look to the future for examples of exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I imagine this applies elsewhere in the world, but I've not traveled anywhere else where it does apply. Anyone who's been to Central or South America will have encountered the fact that in, in Central or South America, you don't flush your toilet roll away. There's a little bin by the toilet, and you put it in there. Because their sewer systems aren't geared up to cope with getting that amount of solid matter out of the system. Um, if you ever take, they're, they're getting harder to find as they get archived. If you ever have a look at the, uh, the off-watt returns for the water industry, look at how much it costs to take not just the shit out of our water, but the toilet roll, the, uh, the other crazy stuff. You would not believe the things people f flush away, right? Um, and there's, there's an extent to which um, in Central and South America, obviously, you know, infrastructures are less mature there. They're more fragile. They're less likely to work reliably. But there's an understanding of that and an appreciation of it that is in some way embodied by that acknowledgement. Oh, hang on, we can't chuck this stuff down the tubes because it'll block the tubes. And, and that is a constant reminder to people who live there, well, oh, hang on, this is a problematic system. It's not someone else's problem, it's at least in part their problem. Yeah. And that's, I mean, a great deal of what I was talking about earlier is, is um, much more a function of privileged countries like ourselves, Western Europe, the States, so on and so forth. Um, that utter, you know, that expectation that stuff will just work is, you know, we are in the minority in that. Yes. The rest of the world is actually very, very aware what it's like to have infrastructure that doesn't work all the time, or even just doesn't work. Um, it would be very nice if we could find a way to reach that sort of awareness, uh, 
in more privileged countries without having to go through the trauma of living through a period where things break really badly. Um, finding ways to do that is kind of what I'm looking to do and, and what I think, if, if infrastructure fiction is to be a thing, that's you know, that problematization of something that we just ignore all the time is exactly what I think design and, and art can do usefully in that space because you know the engineers you can, an engineer can't propose to the country all right chap you know we're going to make things cheaper but it means you can't flush your bog roll I mean there would be you know, well, I don't know if there'd be riots but there'd be an awful lot of angry letters to the Daily Mail and, uh, and we can't have that so are we all up for answering a question in 30 seconds each very quickly because I did say to you sir <laughs> I was going to take your question but we're very close to I'll time. make it very quick. Uh, yes. Daisy, loved your talk. Uh, just on your point earlier, do you think it is science versus society? Or um, is there an element of perhaps uh, society's perception of the commercialization of the science that they find more worrisome? Um, is there a difference there, would you say? Um, and also, what would be your thoughts on the intellectual property, uh, on intellectual property as applied to these mm. synthetic uh, uh, organisms that we're, that we're creating? That's about three or four different questions that were really, really interesting. Um, really, really quickly, I think that um, there's probably different issues in there, science versus society, to the um, society and intellectual property wraps into this question around why the public have a mistrust of science, but I think that there's two separate things in there, and I, um, that there is no way that synthetic biology will work as a technology in terms of its implementation if the intellectual property thing isn't resolved. I don't think that's going to be a small matter. I think the likelihood is that we will see the same structures playing out that already exist and an increasing mistrust of science as a result because people think mm -hmm. it's not, it's, you know, they're not in charge. The, the powers that are making synthetic biology real are uh, governments but also organisations like DARPA or... Um, also corporate interests, and those are the same structures. So that's the need for disruption. But the open source movement within synthetic biology is very interesting and I think needs to be fully explored. And the only way that that's actually going to be promoted is through democratic intervention. Thank you, Daisy. <laughs> and thank you, Tobias and Maya and Paul. Hope you've enjoyed this session. Uh, the revolution begins here, but who knows how. Thank you so much. <laughs>